Gary. Um, well, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, and thank you for being, if you're here now, you're, you're on time. As my old saying goes, uh, if you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. And if you're late, you're fired. Unfortunately, I can't fire anyone who shows up here after, but, uh, but we're excited to have you all here. Um, very excited to have Donna, Anthony, Vicky, and you know, sort of a, a panel of knowledge and expertise here today before we dive all the way into all the great things they're gonna share with us. Um, we're gonna get started and, and uh, go through and launch our webinar. I'm very pleased and honored to, uh, to, to be moderating these webinars for, it feels like I think most of a year now. Uh, and uh, thankful, so thankful to Richard and his amazing team you know, Gary, Kathleen, and the, the whole team at HGAR uh, and one key MLS for putting on this series, this Be Your Best series. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Richard, uh, to sort of tell us a little bit about the series and today's specific session, and then we'll get into housekeeping items and go from there. Thanks, Brian. And you know what? I think it has been a year. I think it's been you a year. Yeah, look at the anniversary day because I think we're coming up on a year. Yeah. Boy, is it flown by. In some ways, it's like, it seems like the past year is, crawled by and sped by at the same time. It's really odd. Yeah. Uh, but good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Be Your Best series, uh, where we share best practices for conduct conducting business amid a changing landscape. Today, we focus on getting the deal done in the luxury housing market. And we have experts here to analyze the numbers and zoom in on the demand for property types, locations, mm -hmm. amenities, and other things in the region. I'm Rich Haggerty, CEO of the Hudson Gateway Association of Realtors. We're a not-for-profit trade organization representing more than 13,000 real estate professionals in Manhattan, the Bronx, Westchester, Putnam, Rockland, and Orange Counties. I'm also president and chief strategic growth officer of One Key MLS, the comprehensive multiple listing service for the New York region. One Key has more than 44,000 subscribers and serves the region from Montauk to Manhattan to Monticello. We're pleased to partner with TitleVest and have, have President Brian Torme here to, to moderate our discussion yet again. TitleVest is a leading New York City-based title insurance agency and member of the First American Family of Companies, offering a full range of services for real estate property purchase and refinance transactions. TitleVest has offices in Manhattan and Westchester and engages in transactions upstate, downstate, and nationwide. Title Vest, Title Vest has won the New York Law Journal's Best Title Agency Award every year since 2013. Now let's meet our panel. Joining us today is Donna Olshan, President of Olshan Realty and the Olshan Group. Donna is a New York State licensed real estate broker and author of the must read Olshan Luxury Report that I read every single Monday morning on the subway station at 77th Street when I'm coming up to Westchester County. We're also pleased to have Vicki Negron join us, a licensed associate broker with Corcoran in Brooklyn. Thank you, Vicki. Also here is Tony Coutinho, a very good friend of mine for many, many years. Tony is the Senior Vice President and Director of Private Brokerage at Houlihan Lawrence. Tony is a licensed associate real estate broker. And if you are on Instagram, check out Tony's Instagram page. It is absolutely amazing. Uh, and we also have Kale Goodman, President and CEO of Market Proof Inc., a real estate data and analytics company in Brooklyn. Donnie, Donna, Vicki, Tony, Kale, thank you for joining us. And Brad, I'm going to turn it back to you. Fabulous. Thank you, Richard. Well, so I'm going to cover a couple of housekeeping items for our, for our attendees uh, and our panelists. Uh, we're, this session is being recorded. We're excited to, uh, to dive into all the stuff here shortly. We very much welcome and encourage questions. Uh, we ask all the attendees to please go to the Q&A function. Depending on the device you're on, it'll be down at the bottom of your screen or possibly at the top of your screen uh, and select the Q&A function, submit your question. I'll be moderating those and looking to incorporate those and weave those into the, the conversation at the appropriate time. So don't worry if your question doesn't get asked right away. Uh, and answered right away, uh, we'll definitely get to it uh, along the course of our conversation when, when we're tackling that topic. Um, otherwise, everyone is muted just to help allow our panelists to uh, their voices to come through clearly, but we are uh, looking forward to hearing your questions and sort of insights. Feel free to use the chat function as well to share your thoughts, your accolades, your agreement, your dissent with things being said. This is an active and uh, democratic conversation to be had. 
Um, well, with that, before we turn all the way into, into today's conversation on the luxury market, you know, Richard, I want to hand the microphone over to you. You always give us amazing stats, and I'm excited to hear what's been going. Before I do that, I do want to turn. I went and looked up something, and it was an article that I remembered from a friend of mine. And Kale, I know you're very friendly with him. All three of us went to the same alma mater. Uh, he's a New York Times reporter named Stefanos Chen. And he wrote an article back in January of 2020 that was talking about the luxury real estate market and the impact, the impact of luxury development and ultra luxury in Manhattan. Uh, and he, the article title was the decade dominated by the ultra luxury condo. And as we turn and look at what's happening in the luxury space, I went back and reread where things were, you know, a year and change ago before the global pandemic. And I was really reminded of this sort of like this pending, there was already trends happening in the inside the luxury space that the pandemic has added a whole other set of layers into. So I'm very excited for today's conversation. Richard, tell us how is our how is our market doing? How is the luxury side of the market doing today as opposed to, you know, well, you don't have the stats as exactly as to a year ago, but how are we doing today? Well, Brian, actually I do. So since we're, since we're focusing really on luxury today, I actually went back to, and I'm focusing on April because we just finished April. Uh, I went back to 2018 and I'm looking at the entire one key market area. Uh, and 2018, we had 46 uh, sales of properties, two, mi 2 million and over. So I kind of picked that random 2 million point. Uh, the top sale was in James Fort, $15 million. Uh, the top sale in Westchester was 7.65 in Rye. Then I went forward a year to 2019, April 2019, and we had 38. So we went from 46 and 18 to 38 in 2019. Uh, top sale was actually in Greenwich, uh, just under 15 mil. There was a $7 million sale in the Hamptons in April of 2019 and a 4 million sale in Scarsdale. Hey, Richard. Yeah. Are those contracts or closings? Those are closings. Closing. Yeah, the actual closings. Fast forward to 2020, and I thought I'd see a bigger dip, but these were obviously transactions that were negotiated in January or February uh, with contracts put together sometime in you know, that first quarter, and they closed in April. Uh, and closings were happening in 2020. Uh, you know, they, attorneys were getting creative. Uh, and there were 37 closings in April, uh, 2 million or over. Uh, the top was 16.4 million in Quag. Uh, there was one for six and a half million in Bronxville. Uh, and then fast forward to last month, April, 2021, we had 125 closed sales, 2 million or higher. So we went from 46 in 2018, April, 2018, 38 April 2019, 37 April 2020, and 125 in April 2021. Now, Tony, I think you're in your office in Bronx. I'm sorry, in uh, Bedford? It, yes. So I just I took a snapshot of Bedford. Uh, 2018, there was one closing in April. Uh, 2019, there was one closing in Bedford. This is all Bedford. And uh, one closing again, 2019 in April. 2020, one closing uh, in Bedford in April. And last month in Bedford, there were five closings. At what price again? Two million and higher. Two. So, wow. yeah. One, one other thing I would love you to do is if you could at some point tell us on this, this, this huge jump, this 37 to 125 and all that, I would love to know what the average size of the house is in these years. I want no, to honey, know. You can't jump ahead, though. We're gonna we're gonna get to that question. Okay. All right. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. But you know what? It does bring to mind. It's a phrase that goes back so many years. Uh, Alan Greenspan, who was chairman of the Fed, talking about irrational exuberance. So I'm wondering, you know, are, are we seeing, you know, instances of irrational exuberance, uh, or you know, is this going to continue? So I'm fascinated by uh, what the panel is going to be sharing with us today, Brian. So I'm going to yeah. throw it back to you. Well, you're, okay. you're dropping the hook in the water. 
<laughs> Let's get this conversation going. Let's go, baby. Well, so with that, I'm going to, Donna, I actually am going to come back to you. You shared some interesting numbers last week, and I'm curious if the, if the 14 week streak has continued. Tell us about what you're seeing in your Olshan report and sort of that, you know, higher than 4 million kind of stuff. What's happening? Okay. Well, I think one thing I'm very curious about is not just the number of sales, but what people are buying. So mm -hmm. what, what happened is we are seeing a streak we've never seen before. We've gone 14 weeks with contracts signed at $4 million and above. 14 weeks at, at 30 contracts or more mm -hmm. at $4 million and above in Manhattan only, okay? We've gone five of, that, of those 14 weeks, the last five weeks, we have gone 40 contracts signed or more at 4 million and above. And we've never seen this. We've been charting this since 2006. So it's an interesting phenomenon. The other thing which I'm looking at carefully is of course, what are people buying? Condos uh, uh, ultimately, but what, what's the difference between, what, why is this uh, time different than other times? Well, people are buying larger condos. So what you're going to see is, and, and this is the statistic that I'm searching for nationwide, people are saying, okay, the price went up and the average price of these condos is higher than it's been in the past, but the size has been 8% larger. So of course the price is going higher. So I would like to know, that's why I asked Richard, and that's why for example, um, a report came out of NAR the other day that we projecting we're 3.8 million homes short. But I would love to know, and, and the prices are rising. I, I, I believe the prices may be rising because the type of property that people are buying is larger than it was in the past. That's what I suspect, but I need to see the data on that. And, and, well, um, let's turn yeah. to a data expert. Kale, I know you shared, you've got some interesting stats on sort of the price per square foot, how much outdoor space, how many transactions have got that. Because Donna, I think your, your gut is probably always right. And yeah. I think your gut is likely right in this case. But Kale, take yeah, us so, to the numbers. So I crunched some of these numbers. Mm -hmm. um, and if we look at the price of new condos with outdoor space, and without outdoor space and what happened pre-pandemic and what's happened since. Uh, we, end, we come up with some, something very interesting, Donna, that I think reflects on, on what you're asking about. So if the unit has outdoor space, irregardless of the size, the price per foot is up 9%. If the unit does not have outdoor space, the price is down 8%. It's an enormous swing between the two. Yeah. Um, now, what's that? Almost 20%. That's as right. Well. Now, of the available uh, inventory in the market, 29% have outdoor space. Um, the amount of outdoor space varies a lot. Some are going to be 50 square feet or 100. Some are substantially more. But the uh, availability of units with outdoor space spans across all price points. Um, Hale, I'm wondering how uh, common outdoor space affects that, as opposed to as an amenity. Is, yeah, do you do you know any have any insight on that? No, that's a good question. We haven't we haven't tracked that, um, so I, I can't give you a, a firm answer on that. Um, but what I what I just to kind of reflect on one other thing that Donna talked about, even though there's a shortage of inventory across the United States, that's not true in New York City. Yeah. Um, so to kind of go back to what one of the things that Brian said, Brian, I don't want to go off script here from getting ahead of ourselves. Huh? You're, you're good. I'm good. There, were, there was a large buildup in inventory in the condo space in New York City um, right. that uh, currently has peaked and is now starting to come down. But we still have something like 14 or 15,000 available unsold sponsor units in New York City. Of those, um, about 3,000, Donna, are priced above 4 million. So these are units that are built, available for sale, 
have not yet been sold. And in Manhattan, or that's with Brooklyn too? That's citywide, but typically 4 million plus, it's gotta be mostly, mostly, mostly Manhattan. It's a smattering in Brooklyn, but not that much. So, so in, in my world, that's gonna take two and a half years to absorb. Something like that, yeah. Um, if we go above 5 million, there's 2,000 units. Wow. And if we go above 10 million, there's 800 units. That's many years of inventory. Um, now those be, units are- That would be um, something like five years to- At least, yeah. yeah. Now, yeah, and with the uptick in volume, we'll, we can see how long those things will take. But anyway, there's, there's, there's a lot of availability. There's a lot of stuff with, with outdoor space. Um, so there's lots that people are able to get right now and they're getting very good pricing. I don't want to get too far ahead, Brian, but that's, right. that's kind of a summary. Beautiful. I love it. Well, you know, I actually, Vicki, you asked a good question there and I want to go back to that question about the amenity space and look at, you know, some of the developments that have happened, whether it's a condo development or, or co-op possibly, and or even sort of how things have operated in, in townhouse areas of, of the market, right? And so you're sort of one of our Brooklyn experts have got a perspective on all those things. I know I, Kale knows my old building. I used to live at the Newswalk, right? Sort of near where the Barclays Center is now. You, it looks like you know my building. Yes. Has beautiful, amazing gardens and outdoor roof deck and a playground up there, barbecue sections. And, you know, I had a, a nice terrace, but like that definitely were I looking, that would have been a building that would have attracted me during this pandemic because of all those amenity spaces. Certainly. It's not just a street front building with, you know, just my apartment in it. Yeah. So tell us, what are some of the things you've been seeing as we've gone through the pandemic, especially in the luxury and ultra luxury market that are drawing and attracting people, especially in, in your neck of the woods? Mm -hmm. So I can speak uh, primarily to Brooklyn sales, which is where the main focus of my energy goes. But what has been driving the the wagon over on our side of the bridge has been predominantly outdoor space, uh, whether it's common or private. Uh, homes with beautiful gardens, believe it or not, there are some homes with no footprint at all, which sell a lot more, uh, have a lot more, um, uh, need a lot more push for them. But, uh, you know, I had an, a funny uh, situation happen at a Clinton Hill condo, beautiful building, fabulous street, tree-lined, idyllic, no outdoor space, big, huge, thousand square foot, uh, one bedroom. Mm -hmm. The minute the condo board decided to lay plans in place for a roof garden, the two sales I had in the building were in contract immediately. Um, uh, it was the driving force that made people look towards that property more favorably. Um, as a the, the total opposite of that being the fact that we are in somewhat of a hyper supply in condos here in Brooklyn. Um, the outdoor space is the highlighted aspect in yeah. terms of amenities. People don't need gyms because, you know, they just don't, they just don't need them. I mean, it's a nice aspect to have, but, you know, I, I think people would living. prefer more a dog wash now because everybody went out and rushed out and got a dog during the pandemic. Um, but, um, the outdoor space, the size of the apartment, someone alluded earlier to the fact that apartments are larger. Um, the fact that we may indeed need to be working from home indefinitely or once again um, is an important factor to consider. So size and outdoor space is almost as important as location to, trans to transportation used yeah. to be. Yeah, now Tony, I'm gonna put a question to you and then a question to you and the whole panel, but you're gonna to get to answer it first. Mm -hmm. So the, the, one, the first question to you is around what you've seen out in the country markets. And we had a very interesting conversation the other day around sort of where people are buying and the total distance from the city and sort of like, are some of those country buys, are they pandemic driven? And is that buyer gonna be happy with what they bought a couple of years later as their thing? So that's one question and sort of share your thoughts on what you're seeing in that. The second question for you and then the rest of our panel uh, is, are these attributes, right? So Vicki, you just spoke about the outdoor space and Kale and Donna shared some great perspective on that outdoor space really driving a lot of decision-making. Is that here to stay? Is that, pre that almost 20% price differential on a per square foot basis that you referenced, Kale, three years from now, is this like pandemic-driven stuff 
Or have people, has the pandemic woken people up to like, yeah, I want to have outdoor space. Whether I'm worried about germs and, and transmissions or not, I want that to be included in my home, you know, part of my home ecosystem, you know. So, so Tony, first question to you, tell us about what you're seeing in the country. And second question, do you think that drive towards really having some, some outdoor space necessarily included in their purchase, do you think that's here to stay? I think, first of all, we have always been about the outdoor space. Even starting with Bronxville, which is only 22 minutes outside of the city, everyone came to Bronxville for a garden. And, and even some of the hilltop houses that we've traded over the years, even though the land may be rugged, there's always outdoor space to enjoy, whether it be a terrace or not. So, so in, in lots of ways, um, it's very hard for us to, to qualify price per square foot because the amenities in addition to uh, beyond the square footage have always been a big part of how we price. And, and also remember we cover a, a very large territory. So we measure for Westchester luxury at 2 million and higher. And the biggest part of our luxury business is two to 3 million. Mm -hmm. for, for further north, as we go into Putnam, Dutchess and Columbia counties in the Hudson Valley, we measure luxury at a million and higher. And then for Fairfield County, um, Greenwich particularly, we measure luxury at 3 million. So, so that um, we have found with COVID, um, our, our market turned on a dime because properties that were no longer desirable by the millennial buying group suddenly became very desirable. Prior to COVID, it was very important to be closer to town, closer to a village, within walking distance when possible. We were having a really hard time selling backcountry Greenwich at that point in time um, because it was just too rural. It was too far from the village. Um, at COVID came, the clubs closed, um, the children were all home, space became important. Um, all of a sudden, all those amenities clicked in and we started selling just overhand properties that we couldn't sell pre-COVID. So, so our market set changed drastically and probably the highest percentage of increase in sales were markets like backcountry Greenwich and properties further north. Mm -hmm. So we, we saw a big change because of COVID, but to answer Donna's question about size, we're not seeing um, bigger is necessarily all that much better. What we're selling is still pretty much what we've always sold. But what we're seeing is a redistribution of the space. So, so, so that having the home office, um, we're finding that the, the open floor plan is not all that desirable right now with so many people being under one roof. So, so, so there are other changes, there are other nuances that are certainly affecting our markets because of COVID. That's very interesting. Now, would some of those attributes, do you think they're here to stay? Give us, you know, what are your thinking is still with us as attribute preferences three years from now? Assuming I, I no think what's happened is, is they are here to stay because a lot of people have forgotten what it, what it tastes like to have a backyard, to, you know, to enjoy your own pool, to, to, to play tennis on your own court, to be able to go hiking from your own property, to have water, to, to have all these features. And, and as our buyers became you know, for the longest time, we all sold real estate as an investment. It became part of your portfolio. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, you know, even uh, probably when our market crashed, our luxury market crashed in 2008, and it, it became a bit harder to sell real estate as an investment in our marketplaces, but we started selling lifestyle. And I, I think now what people have tasted because of COVID is, is lifestyle outside the structure. So these outdoor places, you know, the fire pits have all taken off. Um, they, they, they really, even during COVID, people were figuring out ways where you could go outside and still be together. And, and so um, I think it's here to stay because I think it's once you've tasted it. It's like when you were a child and you finally got to go away to summer camp, it's kind of hard to forget that experience. You know, the next summer you wanted to go back to summer camp because you tasted the outdoors. And I think we're so lucky to have it so accessible, so close to the city. And, and the one thing that will change, well, obviously people will go back to work at their offices, 
And, and, and so, you know, instead of having two primary residences, which seems to be the current play, they'll go back to having one or the other. But I think the second home is going to be a big part of the future. And the third home or the fourth home will probably be added on to that in other places in the world. I'd like to add on to what Tony just said, because I'm finding that um, before they get to his neck of the woods where they can take a dip in the pool or or take a hike on their own property, which sounds like heaven to me, um, our first time buyers who were previously renters are deciding, well, maybe I can't have the white picket fence right now, but how about tomato plants on my terrace? Because the 50 foot terrace is the first leap before they get to be customers of Tony's. Um, they, yeah. It's a gradual progression of needing more space yeah, well, and, and more space outside. I'd like to ask Tony a question, which is when you, are people look right now with the cost of lumber of just about exceeding the cost of steel and the, do people, are they, do you see the, I mean, I think Bedford seems to me when I look at it and, and around Bedford, very undervalued. Do people look at what the replacement costs are for, for building the homes that they're looking at? I mean, it seems to me, has anybody ever evaluated the housing stock in comparison to what it would cost to build? They, they don't. It's so funny, Donna, because they don't, they don't think of it from that point of view. And, and, and Bedford particularly is great value. And some of our other, even lower Westchester towns have become great value. Because there, there have been, there's, there's been so much money invested in the construction or reconstruction of our great period houses. Unfortunately, I, I, I think today's buyer looks at the finished product and wants to move in. They're, they're not concerned about the cost. They're more concerned about being inconvenienced. If they have to do work, we're still having a hard time. I understand that, but why, you know, it's curious to me why it, the values don't move up more like in Bedford, but because just if you wanted to build that, you know, these properties, it would cost you sometimes two to three times what the price of it is now. Equally. It seems to me that the value is very under, that, that these market values are way under what they should be. And, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to get my head around that, you know, it's a replacement cost. These buyers are our buyers are younger. They don't really get it, and and they haven't endured the, the you know the process in general. So so that we're still reducing prices in Bedford. I mean, we've houses we haven't sold, and and quite frankly, when pre-COVID we were on a continual price you know decline because from two thousand we we climaxed in two thousand and seven until last year. Last year was the best year we've ever had, but but until. 2007, we had gone through the roof. Our prices just kept escalating and escalating and escalating. And bear in mind, we have high taxes in Westchester County. So, so in addition to paying more for the house, you were paying higher taxes. Then when our market crashed, our, our prices, houses that we had priced at seven and a half million, by the time they traded five years later, we sold for three or three and a half. I know, but that's the point. But isn't there going to be a rebalance? I mean, because I think you lost a lot of buyers to the Hamptons. The Bedford is a market that I've studied for many years. I feel because we, we had traffic that would go to Bedford and then it got it went to the Hamptons. I think the Hamptons prices are, are gone so high and are continue to go higher that I just wonder if that traffic will get in some way redirected. I hope so for you. <laughs> Oh, it is. It's already happened. And, right. and, and I was going to say, when, when Vicki was talking, uh, we have so many buyers that come out of her market that end up in Columbia County, which is two hours from New York. And we, we were talking the other day about the boom in Litchfield County, which is two hours from New York. And the values of some of these great properties in Litchfield have escalated beyond belief. Last year, we didn't have a deal in Westchester at 10 and higher. There were, there were two sales you know, uh, up in Litchfield this year at 10 million and higher already. And, and, and so I, I think we're in flux. I mean, there's no question about it. And we brokers who have been in the business, especially a really long time, are sitting here now waiting for the other shoe to drop because we're not quite sure what, directions, what direction it's all going. When we ended sales, we feel really good about the second and third quarters this year. So we have a lot pending. And, and 
it, the ratio appended to active is very, very tight in most of our markets. And if I could yeah. just supplement what you just said, Tony, we yeah. have a lot of hesitancy on the part of our sellers in my market who want to go to Westchester County, because if I'm going to sell my three, my three and a half bed, I need a higher price for it because I've got to buy in Westchester where the prices are constantly going up. So it's a kind of a domino effect. It affects but what my decisions are affects how you're going to be. Yeah. We get it. Met with challenges. Yeah. We're losing, we're losing our sellers aren't, aren't buying up or buying down in Westchester. They're moving to Florida. But some of them that have moved to Florida are already coming back because they decide they don't want to be in Florida in the summer. It really didn't work. And unless they're going to have multiple houses, it, it doesn't work for some of our people. So I, I think we have a lot ahead of us, a lot of interesting markets still to improve and a lot of good business still to be had. Yeah, if I could jump in here. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I was up in Bedford recently and it is remarkable. Uh, the person I was visiting has chickens. Um, which we, I, are, we all have chickens. We all have chickens and it was amazing. But then I was in Tribeca uh, and all the restaurants have built you know, fabulous outdoor spaces and it, it felt a, you know, a bit like Paris and it was really wonderful as well. And we're all kind of moving in a lot of directions. Brian, I think to your question, what's gonna happen is TBD. What we know is that we're all moving in many directions. Everyone's reevaluating, looking for the right place for ourselves and our families. Um, but there's a couple of big things to kind of Donna's point about rising asset prices. We also are now entering an inflationary period and what's gonna happen with interest rates. A lot of this is being driven by the low, low cost of financing. Um, you know, if any of these factors change, um, the direction that people are going uh, could also change quite quickly. Yeah, well, and that sort of begs the question and, you know, I'm curious what some of the, again, what some of those patterns people are looking for, what of them, which of them will still stick. But Kale, you're starting to turn to, you know, a little bit of a question, which I think coming back to the ultra luxury and the luxury, especially the New York City luxury and the unique situation that New York City is in relative to much of the country where that market, the luxury market and ultra luxury market, we happen to have here in New York City, the, the, the benefit or problem that many other markets don't have, which is tremendous stock, right? Here in New York City, there's tremendous stock. And it's not just the stock that's on the market, but it's also that shadow inventory part. And we had a fabulous conversation between you and Donna, and between you, Donna, and Kale, uh, and all of us on this sort of, you know, all that shadow inventory. And so I'm curious, Kale, maybe share with us some of the stats and perspectives on sort of what's happening inside that shadow inventory, like how, what's there. And then I want to turn to the panel and talk about, okay, so in part because of all that stock and inventory in this luxury and ultra luxury market. I want to turn to the whole panel and talk about some of the things you're seeing in terms of what's happening from sponsor discounts, how, how they're structuring deals a little differently to, to help move some of that. And then finally turn to like, how much runway do we have with all this? Well, but first, Kale, tell them what shadow inventory oh. is. Okay. You know? And if you want to show yeah. off one of your stack plans is maybe a great way oh, to show. Yeah. Um... Well, let's just start. So shadow inventory uh, is basically the units in a building that are available for sale that are not currently listed. So if you have a building that has uh, 100 units, 10 are listed, the remaining 90 are shadow. Um, and so the shadow inventory uh, has grown quite substantially in the last few years. All of this really predates the pandemic. Um, what the, there, we could long debate how we got here, but rezoning Bloomberg years, um, the 2017, we saw the, uh, sh kind of spigot of foreign buyers shut off, uh, in resulting from some changes in, uh, in Washington. Um, but then subsequently we had some new taxes, uh, mansion tax. There's of course the salt tax, but the mansion tax uh, also had a very profound effect on the high end. Uh, there was a big run up in purchasing before the mansion tax kicked in 
in the middle of 2019. So we can't only talk about Washington when we're talking about the increase in inventory. We also got to look at Albany. Um, and then the uh, pandemic set in. Uh, so you had kind of three shocks to the system, which resulted in this kind of growing uh, quantity of, of inventory out there. Um, but now what we're seeing is that the inventory is getting starting to come down. In other words, the number of units coming onto the market is less than the number of units that are being sold. There's still a lot of product coming. There's still something like 250 buildings yet to come to market in New York City. Uh, so there's still a lot of opportunity. But the good news uh, for buyers and for agents uh, is that the uh, the sponsors are kind of meeting the moment um, out of necessity and the pricing has come down as I described quite a bit, uh, which is offering a good buying opportunity uh, for, for, for buyers. Yeah. And maybe talk a little bit about a few of the things, you know, and here Donna and Vicky and, and Tony are all welcome to chime in here. What are some of those things you're seeing so that the sponsors are sitting on all this excess inventory, or maybe not excess, but more than they'd like, perhaps. Um, some of it they've got on market, some of it's still sort of sitting in stock and shadow. Um, what are we seeing out in the market that's happening with these transactions that is sort of helping them move across, right? You know, go back to Richard's numbers, 120 something transactions in the month of April above that price, uh, 4 million price point, what are we, what are some of the things that are helping push some of those into execution? Uh, closing costs being paid for, uh, parking spaces, um, build to suit, things of that nature, um, bumping up, uh, taking inventory that would be um, more seductive, more, more compelling, and replacing that with what the, a buyer had originally uh, targeted. Uh, that's what I'm seeing. Um, parking is king also. Um, so that's yeah. what's coming into my view right now. Yeah. Donna, how about you? Oh boy, we, we there's a, a whole bushel of goodies depending upon um, who the developer is and what, pre what pressure they're under. Mm -hmm. So um, it could range from paying the mansion tax. It could be several years of common charges uh, throwing in a storage space, uh, concessions on the garage. Of course, what, what I take up exception to is a lot of these discounts are rebated at the closing. And so the market is not really recording the true price. And that's something that I really, that is not good for a marketplace, we, we really need transparency and we need a law having to do with this because if you have so much inventory that is truly being discounted in the shadows, um, you, you, we need the market to fairly record it. And by the way, it behooves the state and the city to get their arms around the proper data and they don't have it because they don't force people to record all of these concessions. But the developers, will try to hold on to a price and they can give you hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of concessions at the closing. That's not unusual because they wanna hang on to their price, the recorded price to the marketplace. So these, this is an, you know, this is, you're navigating, every project is different, but um, overall, I mean, you see, you can walk into a project and it's not unheard of that uh, in the end, you end up with 20% below what the original offering plan price was. Yeah. And Kale's just shared in um, the chat for everyone uh, a, a link to, okay, well, actually, Kale, why don't you describe what it is? Yeah. So I, this is a, a, a spreadsheet that you can use with your clients uh, that helps you get from the recorded price to what the ultimate price is with all the concessions. Um, so, you know, any, any good developer has some of these things built into the pricing uh, from the jump. They're expecting buyers to come knowing that they can get these things. Uh, if they can't, good for them. But this is just a worksheet that you can use uh, that just kind of lays it out, the different things you can ask for 
um, and calculates uh, what your ultimate discount will be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Brian, can I ask Good. a follow-up question? Go for it. Uh, and this is really to uh, Donna as well as uh, Kale. Donna, one of the great things about your Monday report is you do document some of those nuances and some of those facets of the transaction. Uh, given you know, the amount of inventory and the shadow inventory that uh, Kale just talked about, do you see that landscape continuing? Where yeah. sellers are going to continue to recognize that it's it's not going to be a seller's market that they've got to offer. Oh well, some I mean some are some aren't. It's just been tightening up in the last couple of weeks, but um, in terms of the differential between the original asking price and the last ask, and by the time it goes to contract, so it's something that I'm watching carefully. Um, I don't think that the consumer right now has the appetite to digest a much uh, higher prices. I think it's got to stay where it is. And the consumer wants to feel at least in Manhattan, like they're getting a pretty good buy. Um, the market right now in Manhattan is mostly New York area buyers, some California, some Florida, and we have, no mo we have no global market. So we're really operating with a half a tank of gas, but the market is selling. It's selling because of the confluence of the pandemic. We have the vaccine now. That unleashed tremendous demand. People came out into the market looking for the COVID-19 discount, leveraging the interest rates, which are very low, and a raging stock market most of the time. So all of that, you know, got the Manhattan market back on its feet. I think that we still have to feel, it seems to me that the buyers still have to feel like they're getting a pretty good deal. These are New Yorkers now. These are hardcore New Yorkers and they want to feel a value. And there are enough sponsors, developers out there that have enough pain that they can get an opportunity there. Yeah, you know, Donna, you just brought up another interesting point, which is the international buyer. Um, and the international buyer will be back. It hasn't really happened yet. But again, there's been, you know, another change down in Washington and the tides are turning a bit. Uh, there's a couple of buildings uh, that we work with that are actively uh, kind of getting their international um, buyer um, structures back in place so they can start bringing those people back to New York. And I'd like to add to Donna's point yeah. uh, that uh, the value point, um, I work with buyers who have been looking for a year. So they've seen the fluctuation in prices. And when they spot uh, a property that hits that magical point of value for them, they jump on it. And I encourage them to jump on it aggressively, meaning at or over its asking price, because the price we feel is not going to stay the same, it's going to go up. Mm. Um, so um, much to your point, I agree, the value, it, it drives the deal. It, if it's expensive, but you love it, there's the value. Yeah, well said. Well, I wanna turn to, you know, questions come up in the, in the chat, and I think it's relevant to some of these things we're talking about. One of the things that is influencing, you know, sort of Tony, to your point, sort of, you know, put some a damper on, especially the Westchester market with its higher real estate taxes, was the salt tax provisions and cap, right? Now, you all are working with some very smart buyers and investors, uh, and yourself have great perspective on this. We got a new administration. What are what are you feeling? And this is extremely relevant to our luxury market. What are you thinking if you have to prognosticate what's going to happen in the in the coming years as it relates to that ten thousand dollar cap? What do you think is going to happen? Who well, we we you know, we're all anticipating salt will possibly go away, and and that will you know solve that problem. For us, um, we had to discount our prices, and yeah. and when we started you know getting real about where we price properties. They sold for a, a very close to the last original offering price. 
-hmm. so, so that we, we noticed with our most recent sales that the, the, the gap between the last offering and the actual selling price got very, very narrow. And properties that were priced on the mark sold for over asking, mm -hmm. especially you know houses under two million. But we watched that creep into the two and three million range as well. So so we're not you know we don't deal in all that much new construction up in in our marketplaces, although it does exist. So we're not able to to discount. The only thing we can do is discount the price. And and when we crashed in two thousand and eight, that's exactly what we started doing. So that when the market turned on a dime, we were primed to sell because our prices were were our prices were at a proven value point. Yeah. Vicky, what do you think? Oh, you're muted. I think I ought to unmute first. Uh, I, I think I agree with Tony. Um, I, I don't like to project. Uh, or forecast what's going to happen four years from now. But I think that uh, um, things are moving so quickly that it's hard to keep a tab on on where they're going to be at this point next next, even next quarter, year. in the next quarter. Or even next quarter. Um, in, so uh, we are working furiously to fulfill the needs of the current buyers and sellers that we're dealing with. And our hope is that that, that uh, level of um, availability proceeds and continues. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Well, we've got- a We have chickens in Brooklyn too. I want Carol to know <laughs> that we, we have Fair chickens enough. in Brooklyn. Yeah. yeah. Not many. Well, not uh, many. Probably, yeah. probably not as many. Um, I want to turn to, you know, one of these questions, we've sort of got this exuberance in the market. Richard, I go back to your statistics, right? 38, uh, 46, 38, 37, 120 something, right? exuberance in the market. And, and I'm going to go around the horn and ask each panelist to answer two questions. One, is this a bubble? Is this exuberance, this, this fervor, is there a bubble factor to it? And two, assuming that it keeps going at this pace, how, much, how long do you think it's going to, how long is this fervor, is this fever pace going to last? What does this runway look like of this intense volume of just People needed to jump on things and things flying off the shelf. Uh, Vicki, we've got you up on the screen. So we're going to start with you first. You know, I think it is a bubble. I, I don't know if I think that that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, I think that the reason that people come particularly to our neighborhoods in Brooklyn is because they feel like a neighborhood. But mm -hmm. if a million come a quarter, it's not going to feel like a neighborhood anymore. It's going to feel like Third Avenue and 47th Street, which is something that they you know, to hypothetically to want to get away from. Mm -hmm. So as the wealth pushes east, mm -hmm. um, no place to go west here. As the wealth pushes east, the neighborhoods become saturated. I think the bubble will re reach its maximum and mm -hmm. things will tend to stabilize. Mm -hmm. I, I use stabilize as a synonym for decrease. Uh, I don't want to use decrease. So I'm using stabilize. Um, we are busy nonstop. I I almost never uh, put my phone down because people are buying and selling and renting and uh, and uh, moving up in at such a fast pace that it just can't sustain itself. It's, yeah. gotta, it's something's got to change. But um, the the things that we're after as uh, a community remain the same. We want better. We want more. We want larger. We want fresher air. And we want our children to be educated. So they're seeking those things and those things have to emerge in other communities. That's my thought. I hope I answered that question. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Can, I, can I jump, can I go in next? Yeah. Go for it. Because I'm gonna, um, so Brooklyn, um, the, it's been going now for more than a decade. And Brooklyn um, has more condo sales on a transaction basis than Manhattan. Um, the dollar volume is substantially less because the price point is lower, but the total number of transactions is actually higher. Um, and Queens is also, uh, you know, rising a lot on the Western edge of Queens, Long Island city in particular, again, at a much lower price point. Um, so, you know, Brian, I think it really depends on where we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Manhattan is doing just fine. Yeah. The prices are way down. 
but the volume is on it described is really picked up a lot. Um, so is it a bubble? I, I, I think it largely depends again on decisions that are made for in, in government and with interest rates. Mm -hmm. If the rates stay low, this there's gonna be a lot of activity for a long time. Um, everyone's hunting for where they wanna be. If they can afford second and third homes, to Tony's point, there's gotta be lots of activity all over the place as people are darting around in a million directions. Okay, and how much, talk a little bit, Kale, especially around like, how much runways there if let's say interest rates stay low and we we have government policy which continues to support the sort of the, the activity we're seeing now right whether that's reversal of salt whether that's you know no pied de terre tax you know hand right <laughs> right my lips god's ears you know all these things uh you know if we see those things what kind of runway are we talking about you and donna were on the fly doing some math of like oh for that unit size that's five years of inventory like what are we talking about here yeah, at the high end, there's tons of inventory. This can go on for a long time. Uh, it's just a question of price. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, the question is, you know, at these price points, somebody loses. It's not the buyer. It's primarily the seller. Um, and uh, however, if as the inventory comes down, the you get to more of an equilibrium state, um, prices could start to stabilize and even come up. Um, so we'll just have to wait and see kind of what happens. There's there's tons of runway left. This could go yeah. on for quite a long time, years. Okay. And and new communities keep continuing to emerge. Yeah. So where we where the most popular aspects uh, get to overflow, Brooklyn Heights or Borum Hill or Cobble Hill, then then Crown Heights becomes attractive, or Long Island City or Queens or you know, uh, yeah. Ridgewood, who knows? The key Where's Ridgewood? Be ringing you know? for years. Yeah. Um, it, it is. Donna. You know what? I want to jump in. I want to demo an, uh, something I've been thinking about. This is, this is Ooh. my first, first time on the press. Okay, let's go. First, first time. Okay. So I'm thinking about something that I call, um, and I don't know if it exists, the demand quotient which is the sum of what is the demand for any one product. And in, in this particular case, I'm evaluating what's the demand quotient for luxury real estate. In the years, when I go back and I look historically, in the years from 13 to 14, 15, I call those the golden years of new development. And in those years at $4 million and above, the average contracts signed was 1,350 in that area. That was the number of contracts for the year. Mm -hmm. Then you get down to 15, 16, and then you get down to 16, 17, and 18, right? Those years were more like 1,150. So now we get to 19, which was uh, 935. So my thought process is, okay, 20, what if 20 and 21, 20 was what I call the garbage year, throw it out, it was the pandemic year, and 21 is the catch up year. If we had a stable um, luxury market in two years, we would be selling roughly 2100 contract sign over a two year basis. So right now, between last year, which was 645 and this year, we've sold about 1,340 contracts. That means we've got to catch up something like 750 to 800 contracts mm -hmm. in order to catch up to what we lost in 20. And so that comes out to about 25 contracts signed to 27 contracts signed per week. And I do think that is possible. So it's, it's all we're doing, is it a bubble? We're catching up to what we lost. And Donna, that's my, that's my, it's, it's just a theory. I'm putting it out there. I don't know if it's, if it's true, but that's how I'm looking at it. We're just catching up to what we lost. And this year we'll, it'll have astronomical numbers, but it's only because we lost them in 2020. And that was the sum total. That was the pent up demand. So it's the demand quotient. That's my theory. I don't know. 
Okay, I think as, as a statistician, you'd be saying like these two years because of an outside factor need to be averaged together and redistributed from account. Exactly. So it's like you didn't go to the restaurants in 20, you're going to go to more restaurants in 21. You didn't travel in 20, you're going to do it in 21. You're going to, whatever it is you didn't buy, you're, it's all the catch up factor. And that's what I think we are seeing in real estate and in other parts of the economy. We're just catching up. And if you averaged it over the two years, it's probably would con can be considered normal. I think that's a very interesting thesis. I think it's yeah, but, very interesting. What I was going to say though, is you, you've got to recall that we were closed for three months last year. Correct. Uh, starting so, to, when you try to compare the statistics, you can't. We keep, a bit to, you can't, you keep, you have to bear in mind that we were basically shut for three months. And yes, we all op operated virtually, but it was tough and, and we did deals. And we did one of the biggest sales we've ever had in Dutchess County virtually during that period when we were closed. But, but it's so hard to compare apples to apples when you realize we were shut for such a long period of time. Mm -hmm. and, and I like to think of it as not so much a, a bubble, but, but a cycle. I've got a, a lot of gray hair and have been in this business for a really long time. And we've always lived in and out of cycles. So often they were only two years. We've had a, we'd have a two year great cycle and then we'd fall for two years, but then we'd come right back up. We, we had a 12 year kind of bad cycle. When we crashed in luxury at, in 2008, it took us a long time. We were, we were the myth of Sisyphus. We kept rolling that rock up the hill and it kept rolling back down. We, we never got to where we wanted to go. Where they, we got there last year. And is it because of COVID? Probably. But, but also, we had that huge wave of buying for the people who didn't have to sell to buy. And, and then we, we, we kind of got a little quiet because now we were dealing with the wave of people who had to sell their apartment in New York to buy a house in Westchester or Greenwich. And, and, and so now that they're starting to sell, maybe we're going to have that second wave and it could be as big as the first wave if they've decided they want to leave Manhattan. So, so I think we're in flux and I don't think any of us can really predict where we're going to end up. Yeah. But it's exciting. Well, I think, I, Tony, perfect way to end it. It's exciting. Um, we don't necessarily know where it's all going to end, but I think it's, uh, it's going to be an exciting ride. And we're at the top of the hour. And I want to thank you panelists for being here, sharing your wisdom, your perspective, your insights. Uh, with our audience uh, and all of us. It's been a fabulous conversation. Clearly, there's a lot of fervor, a lot of activity, a lot of excitement in the luxury market. And I look forward to seeing how things go. Maybe, Richard, a year from now at our two-year anniversary, I'd love to like bring the team, this team back together, revisit this topic and see how, see how it's all panned out. Because um, it's been a great conversation. Donna, I think your, your demand quotient, you need to get, a, you need to get a, someone to help get that paper published because that's that's a theory okay, Brian, you help me with that okay <laughs> okay you have an economist you throw okay. it to him and see if it makes sense okay. I, I do have an economist uh okay let's well let's talk about it i like that idea uh, but thank you again for everybody for being here richard and and hgar team thank you for hosting again a fabulous session and you know a, a, a little plug out there you know, we, I love doing these. We're a title insurance company. We love doing transactions. So if you've got transactions, you know, I'm here to support you and all your transactions across the way. Um, so for a little shameless plug, because everybody's got so many falling out of their ears. Um, well, with that, Brian, thank, right, thank you, Brian. Thank, thank you. Richard. Richard. Yeah, Richard, did, was there something else you wanted to say? Just to put everybody have to put on their calendar, June 10th, that's going to be our next, uh, your best series. So June 10th, put it on June your calendar. June 10th. Thank oh, you. and I'm going to put in the chat a video that uh, is, is, it's a poet that I'm a big fan of. And he does these fabulous videos. I promise you'll enjoy watching it. And it's, it was done very early pandemic and it's this great realization and it's sort of this waking up. It goes back to that question of, uh, and some of the comments made earlier, like, did the pandemic make us wake up and sort of realize we want some of these different things in our lives. So I hope everyone can click the link and go watch a little, a little poem put to video. Uh, it's a fabulous piece. So with that, we'll wrap at the top of the hour. Richard, thank you. Let's put June 10th in your calendar and we'll see you all here again then. Take care all. Thanks, everybody, appreciate it. Bye-bye.